Well, good morning. Um, a number of things have happened in the last two weeks. Uh, we've talked about a couple of them. Uh, and in particular, the big day um, has come and gone. And if you were here two weeks ago when I had the opportunity to speak to you, you'll know that the big day that I'm referring to is not the election, but the big day was a few days after that, November the 12th, in fact, a week ago yesterday. And also, um, I believe if you were paying attention earlier today, you also heard what that big day was. For us, it was the wedding of our one and only daughter, so although we are parents-in-law again, uh, because our oldest son, Paul, is married, um, and they have an 11-month-old girl, um, we, are, uh, we have a son-in-law now for the first time, and I'm pleased to report. And so this is a little bit of the picture of the big day. Um, since we were part of the wedding and we were in the wedding, we didn't take any pictures. And so this is just from what some other people have posted on Facebook. The uh, pictures, official p pictures from the photographer aren't back yet, so we don't have those to show to you. But I think you can tell by um, the smiles on their faces, the joy that they um, have found in each other in the Lord. And as we were there, uh, we all just were blessed. A lot of people said it was one of the most meaningful services they'd been to before. I, uh, in a completely unbiased way, would totally agree with that <laughs> and um, uh, completely objective about it. But it was very beautiful. And, and as you know, if you uh, are married and if you have been to a wedding before, if you know someone who's been married before, even if you have never been to a wedding before, but you know someone who has, um, usually you hear these reports about how this really has a way of focusing all of us upon the Lord, because really isn't marriage a demonstration, it's a revelation of the relationship that we have with Christ. Paul says uh, it's a mystery, but I'm talking about Christ and the church. And so I believe that this couple has, uh, has had their prayers answered, that the people who attended would really experience that, and I believe that we did. It was just a wonderful opportunity to remember that we are the bride of Christ, and we're awaiting him, we're awaiting his return, and when he comes, will be that day, the big day. And we also talked about this a couple of weeks ago, but I'll just remind us that, that the big day, the big day is the marriage supper of the Lamb. And we read a few more verses than this last time, but just to refresh our memory, uh, in Revelation 19, verse 9 in particular, says, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. So think about all the plans that are made for an earthly wedding. I know I have been thinking about those, not as much as my wife Michelle has been thinking of those, not as much as Rachel and Kevin were thinking about those, but all of those things come together. It all comes to fruition on the wedding day, and think about how glorious this day is going to be, the marriage supper of the Lamb. Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And so today we need to think a little more about that and, and ask ourselves some questions. And that those would be, will you be invited? Probably many of us, most of us in this room have given our lives to Christ and we expect to be invited to that. We expect to be there. Will your family be invited? Some of your family may be here with you. Some of your family is not here with you. Will your family be invited? Will your friends be invited? Uh, we have lots of friends, Facebook friends, but we have actual friends. Some of our Facebook friends are actual friends, right? But these are people that we do life with. These are people that are around us all the time, or we're around them all the time. Neighbors, coworkers, uh, fellow students, people that we see frequently because we go to a particular store um, or attend certain events with regularity. These are the people that are our friends. Will our friends be invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb? 
these are eternal questions, and uh, so this is really part two of what I was able to share with you two weeks ago. Uh, at that juncture, we were looking ahead to two big events. Yes, the election, which was a big event, and a more important event to us, the marriage of our daughter. And then as we discussed, the most important future event was still in the future, and it still is today, and that is the marriage supper of the Lamb. But you know, a couple of weeks ago, uh, also, uh, two weeks ago this past Sunday, uh, two weeks ago today, in the evening, we, had, we started a couple of prayer meetings here. And we had really good participation. In the evenings, we had about 15 or so people. In the mornings, we had about eight people. And you know, there was a sense of urgency uh, as we got together and prayed. Uh, nobody at that point knew exactly what was going to happen with the election. Um, now that we do, there's a sense of relief, perhaps relief if your candidate won. Uh, even if your candidate didn't win, there's a certain sense of relief because there's not this uh, uncertainty anymore. Things are determined and they're moving forward. And thankfully, our system of government allows for a peaceful transition of power. And we should continue to be grateful for that and thank God for that, pray for that transition to happen. But you know, I noticed something as we were praying two weeks ago and those couple of days leading up to the election, and that was this. We were praying for God's mercy, and we also prayed that the things that we were thinking and feeling then, that we would not leave off with those things after the election. Because you know, actually we wound up praying for a lot of different things. We prayed for the community. We prayed for people who are outside of Christ to come to know Christ. We prayed even for other nations. We prayed for all kinds of societal ills like abortion and human trafficking and prayed for God's intervention in these kinds of things. And I wonder if we had, had, if we had not had the urgency of the election, right, that would we have thought to get together and pray about some of those other things? And so that just goes to show us really how God works because he, he gets our attention and we get together and we pray and, and then even more than we were planning on can happen and sometimes does happen. And so I pray that that will continue to happen and that we will continue to get together. We will actually have a couple of opportunities coming up on Saturday, uh, December the 3rd and Saturday, December the 10th. Um, David Mikesel, one of our elders here, felt the Lord saying, hey, why don't we organize a group of people to pray at the courthouse for unity in our culture, um, for God's grace to be upon our nation. And so we will actually be inviting a couple of churches that we have close relationships with to join us in that time. We don't have the exact time, but it'll be in the early to mid-afternoon, probably 2 o'clock or so, on Saturday the 3rd and Saturday the 10th. So that's something that you can plan for as well. Um, to just engage with God and ask for his mercy, his continued mercy, right? Because we were asking for his mercy before the election. We still need his mercy now. But we have a tendency, and I can certainly speak for myself, uh, to, um, you know, once something sort of gets behind this, well, then maybe we're on to the next thing, or we have to focus on something else. But we tend to forget the urgency and the need that is there. And so I would encourage you um, to... Uh, be present at at least one of those meetings if you can. Who knows what other things will happen as a result of us getting together at those meetings. And so, but at that point, you know, we were focusing on the future and thinking about this event that was coming up, the election, and wondering how it was going to all turn out. And when we're in that anxious and uncertain state, we do tend to get religion don't we? If we don't have it already. Uh, uh, there's no atheist in a foxhole. You've heard these kinds of things before. And although we would love to be equally urgent all the time, we're not, at least not yet. And so part of what I want to do today is encourage us to continue the sense of urgency for God's kingdom to come and his will to be done, even though that big event is now behind us. Big events certainly do have a way of focusing us on the big picture. And so I don't know if I need to just kind of psych myself out and, 
and pretend that there's a deadline or a big event coming up and maybe that'll kind of get me in the mode of being urgent, um, we'll, we'll look into that a little bit and see uh, if that might help. <laughs> maybe that'll help me, maybe that'll help you. But previously when we talked about focusing on the future, we talked about how regardless of how things turn out in the future, we have a kingdom. We belong to a kingdom. It's God's eternal kingdom, which is a forever kingdom. And so that kingdom is going to go on regardless of any of the changes of kingdoms in this world. In fact, the scriptures say the kingdoms of this world will become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. So that's the kingdom we should always be focusing on, even as we pray for our own government and the kingdoms of this earth. Also, as we at that point were looking ahead and wanting to focus on the future of past the election, we were also encouraging one another to focus on God's eternal attributes because God is the one who, who rules this kingdom that's an eternal kingdom, and he is a matchless king. And so we looked at Isaiah 40 and talked about a lot of the attributes of God. And then we talked about our eternal purpose, because regardless of the immediate purpose that we see and the immediate events that are unfolding before us, we have an eternal purpose that is connected to God's kingdom and God himself that he has given to us. And the other week, we talked about part of that purpose, which was from 1 Peter 2. And in that passage, um, God refers to us as living stones. We are like living stones that are being put together, being built into a temple, just like a non-living stone is built into a structure. We as living stones are being put together in to be a holy temple that God lives by his spirit. So as the people of God are being gathered, right, as they come into the kingdom, we are being set in place in this building, which is the temple of the Lord, not a physical temple anymore, but the people of God as the temple of God. And so we're being put together just right where we're supposed to be. And that's a vision, isn't it, of the marriage supper of the Lamb. All those people that are living stones that are being put together, we're all going to be there on that day. We're all invited. Now, not everybody who is going to be there is in God's kingdom yet. And so that's why I'd like for us today to focus on another aspect of our eternal purpose, and we see this in particular in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and this is an amazing passage uh, that's quite instructive to us about the nature of the gospel, the message of the gospel, the power of the gospel, and that we are the carriers of the gospel out into the world. We are God's ambassador. So let's look at this passage now, and uh, we'll read through it and then just make a couple of observations, okay? So it starts off like this, for the love of Christ controls us because we have concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died. And he died for all that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Have you thought about the gospel before when you've read that passage? It's a, it's a wonderful place to go to be instructed about the gospel. 
and our eternal purpose as ones who share the gospel. So I'm going to take these in sections. Uh, one time, well, let me ask you this. Does anybody remember me doing a sermon on this passage in the past at any point? That's great, because I can go ahead and do the same one now, and you won't know. So that's, oh, wait a second. I think I just blew that opportunity. I wasn't supposed to, I was just supposed to do it and not say it. This is not the same sermon, but this was the text for the very first sermon that I had the privilege to present to you, which was, I believe, June the 13th of 2010. I looked it back up. Uh, you hadn't yet even formally hired me as the associate pastor, and so... You know, I guess if, you, if you're a church and somebody preaches about the gospel, that's a safe bet, right? So, but really, the reason that I, that I selected that was because I had heard about what this church was doing. And among many different activities, you were doing Alpha at the time. And, and we had been here and visited, and we saw the outreach that was happening in the community. And it really was encouraging that this was a congregation that understood and was applying itself to outreach. And so, so I selected that particular passage, and it was very, very instructive to me at the time. At that point, we actually went verse by verse and just kind of made an observation about each verse. But this time, as I'm looking at it, um, there's really just kind of some focal points that I think that we should look at today. And in these first couple of verses, look at what's in red there that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him. So as the new heading that I put up there says, we were created to live for God. Now, that's kind of obvious, most likely, to those of us who've been in the faith for a while. It's the right answer. It's doctrinally correct. We were made for God's glory. But what's our experience of that? Do we always act that way? Do we always live that way? Well, we don't. And many times, and in pre-service prayer this morning, I was praying and said, Lord, you know, so many times I'm just not really even cognizant of what you're doing. I'm not really thinking about your plan. I'm not focused on you. I'll tell you what, before the election, I was kind of focused because what was going to happen? Were we going to, was something going to change? I mean, things are going to change one way or the other, right? But what's, what's the future going to be? Is our culture going to be as free as it has been? Will it be more free? Will it be less free? What will our faith be like? What, what uh, constraints or pressures will we continue to, to feel or, or not? And so I was pretty serious about living for God then, and in that moment, it's like, well, Lord, oh, yeah, you know, there are people not in your kingdom now that you want to be in your kingdom. Thank you for reminding me about that. And so, you know, in those crisis points, uh, in those as we're anticipating those big events that are coming, we tend to be more focused, but uh, other times maybe not so much. Actually, we were created to live for God. And so he died so that we might no longer live for ourselves, but for him. So as we think about the gospel, this certainly applies, doesn't it? Because if we were created to live for God, he has a plan and purpose for that life, and that's pretty clearly communicated in this passage. Also, how are we going to do that? How can we actually live for God? Because prior to coming to Christ, there really is no way to live for God. Because any good deeds that we might do are done entirely selfishly, even though we think that we're doing it for somebody else. Really, the motivation before you are born again is, is just to reconcile the world around you, to see what's really there and to see, well, I, I, I really need, people are in need, I should help them. And of course, that's partly because we are made in the image of God, so we still bear that imprint even if we're outside of Christ. And so there is uh, there is eternity in people's hearts and in their minds. And we do know uh, intuitively to a degree that we are to be doing good. But to actually live for God with our whole lives surrendered to him, that's not possible without the spirit of God living in us. And so 
this is a pretty key aspect of these next few verses here. If, any, if anyone is in Christ, though, he is a new creation. So we need new life to actually live for God, and so do all the people around us. And so as we think about communicating the gospel, here's really the first two points. We were made to live for God, and the only way we can live for God is to be born again. We need new life. We need the life of God's Spirit in us in order to actually live for God. And so look at what's being said before and after this verse here. No one, we're, we're not thinking about people in an earthly way anymore. We're thinking about people with this potential that they have to be in Christ and as eternal beings because one way or the other, with or without Christ, we will go on forever. If anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has passed away and the new has come. Now that's pretty exciting. So as we think of ourselves... And as we think of others, we've got to remember, this is a whole new ball game. Um, this is a totally different dimension of life to be born of God, not born of the flesh nor of the will of man, but born of God. It's a totally new thing. John 1.12 says to all, and how does somebody get in Christ? John 1.12 reminds us of that. Uh, he came to his own, his own did not receive him, but to all who did receive him, that is Jesus, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And so if you're in Christ, it's because you have believed in him, you've received him and believed in him. And so that's I mean, there's many different ways that we explain the gospel, right? Uh, the Romans road is one way. Some of you have heard about that. All of sin and falling short of the glory of God. Uh, the wages of sin is death, but the free, free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, and so on. Uh, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. If you, believe in your, if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart, confess with your mouth Jesus is Christ, believe in your heart that God raised him from the, your, the dead, you'll be saved. You know, all these little nuggets that are in scripture that we put together to present the gospel to someone. Well, here's another way. We were made to live for God. You can't live for God unless you have new life. You have to have God's life in you to live, to live for God. And if you do, if you have received Jesus Christ and you believed in his name, you are born again. You are now a child of God. And the old is gone and the new has come. And the old tries to get back in there, but we have to keep you know, kind of pushing it away, don't we? But the new has come. And look at this. This is from God, it says, who through Christ reconciled us to himself. Right. So we are no longer alienated from God. We're no longer enemies of God. We're children of God. And gave to us the ministry of reconciliation. So the title of that other sermon six years ago, six and a half years ago, And don't, you know, if you, if you give sermons, don't, I mean, when you go back and look at some of the old ones, it can be encouraging, but it can really be kind of tough because six and a half years ago, yeah, I was thinking about some of those things and I, I, I received certain things from the Lord that I also shared with you at that point and I was thinking about that and, and John, I mean, six and a half years how many people have come to Christ you know, because of your life, John, in the last six and a half years? Now, um, it's not all on us. We're not each individually you know, supposed to save every single person. We don't even save people, right? God saves people. But it really makes you stop and think. And as we think about focusing on the future and focusing on forever... We just really can't escape this truth, which is we're made to live for God. We can't live for God apart from Christ. And he's calling us to call other people to live for God. <laughs> and so we are reconciled reconcilers. That was the title of that sermon six and a half years ago. We are reconciled reconcilers. We've been reconciled to God, and he's given us the ministry of reconciliation. So it's kind of like, you know, somebody was there to, give the, to show me the gospel, to, to tell me the gospel. I mean, my parents raised me 
to know the Lord. Uh, his word was there in the congregation that I grew up in. I read the Bible, uh, a lot of different circumstances. It wasn't a big event for me, but I came to understand that I was in the Lord. And so if I'm in the Lord and I'm reconciled, then I can bring somebody else along. And then once they're reconciled, you know, they can bring somebody else along and it just keeps going. And actually, all of us are only here because that has happened ever since the ministry of Christ on earth. That gospel has come down through the ages to us. Isn't that wonderful and amazing? And aren't we thankful for all those people who came before us who were engaged in this ministry of reconciliation so that others found out, others came in, they became living stones, they got put into that building that is the temple where God's going to live and that will be the people of God at the marriage supper of the Lamb. So we are reconciled reconcilers. So also now we call others to live for God. So we were made to live for God. Um, we need new life to live for God. And we call others now to live for God. And so we are ambassadors for Christ. God making his appeal through us. So... I'm glad to bring this back to my own attention and to our attention again because we really need to continue to think about this so that we don't um, fail to uh, accomplish the purpose that God's put us here for. So um, God was, th this is great. As you are, you know, for me, just looking at this whole passage, it's like, it's so instructive. And if I think about these things, I meditate on these verses, it really gives me, um, truth to extend to people as I am sharing the gospel with them. Look at what he says here. God was reconciling the world to himself, right? Because also in John 1 it says um, that Jesus came not to condemn the world, but to save the world, right? This is really great good news and as we extend it to other people, we're telling them this too. You know, God is not counting our trespasses against us right now if we will trust in Christ. We don't have to pay for that sin, that is an amazing, great good news. And that's the message of reconciliation. He's not, he's for, he is a forgiving God if we will trust Christ as our Savior. And so he's making that appeal through us. And so this is a great word. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. When's the last time I implored anybody to do anything? Um, I feel like maybe I shouldn't implore people to do things because that's not politically correct, or that's not really even appropriate or nice or a Christian to kind of get in somebody's face about something. I'm not saying we need to go start up arguments to try to argue people into the faith, but there's this, see, see the urgency in that word implore, right? There's a certain urgency in that that I don't always have unless there's some kind of a deadline, like an election or a marriage uh, or a new job or there's a baby coming, or there's something that's making me get ready, okay, because I'm not as disciplined of a person as most of you are in getting ourselves ready for things and in continuing to, to function in the purpose that God's called us to. So he made him who knew no sin, who, or excuse me, that's a different, no, that's this version. Uh, he made him to be sin who knew no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. What an amazing exchange that is. That is, you have nothing. Basically, what you can tell somebody that doesn't know Christ, whether you realize it or not, right now, you have nothing. Um, and the future is even bleaker. <laughs> but you can have everything. We're made to live for God. You can't live for God without his life in you. But I'm telling you, you need to live for God. And, and he's not counting your sin against you. Uh, he wants to reconcile to you. Um, he even sent his own son to take all the penalty that we deserved so that we could have all of his riches. You know, he took upon all of our sin and dirt and filth so that we could have his riches and eternity in glory with him. And so it's an amazing exchange um, that is great good news that we need to remember to tell others about. So... Just to summarize that section there, we were created to live for God. And we need new life to live for God. And we are in this world to call others to live for God. 
And as I look at that passage, that's a, a good way for me right now at least to summarize that and to remind myself why am I in this world right now. And again, for me, deadlines help and they kind of create a sense of urgency. And so if I knew when Jesus was coming back, maybe I'd be more urgent about letting others know. That sounds like it shouldn't be, but it kind of is that way. Um, one of my former students from Richmond, 23 years old, um, died uh, a couple of weeks ago. And thankfully, as far as all of us who were her teachers and mentors know, she's with the Lord. Um, but we don't know what's happening next. Um, we would assume that somebody that's 23 is going to be around for a, a long time. I would assume that someone who's 50, like myself, would be around for Maybe I'm not even quite halfway. Maybe I'm more than halfway, but possibly I could be a little less than halfway. Or I might not see you next week, right? So it, we don't know. So do, do we have a sense of urgency uh, in getting this good news out, right? Jesus says, don't put this light under a bushel. I mean, think of the blessing that you and I have received, and, and, and we're not we're just not thinking about extending that blessing to others. We'll talk about that again here in a minute, but I've asked Daniel to come and share uh, a parable that's been written a while ago. I think this was maybe written in the 40s or 50s or maybe 60s. Um, but this little parable um, kind of illustrates to us what can happen to us uh, if we don't keep the focus of, of uh, the Lord and of his gospel uh, in front of us. So thank you, Daniel. Go ahead. The Crude Little Life Saving Station, a parable by the Reverend Dr. Theodore O. Weddle. On a dangerous seacoast where shipwrecks often occur, there was once a crude little life saving station. The building was just a hut, and there was only one boat, but the few devoted members kept a constant watch of the sea, and with no thought for themselves, they went out day or night tirelessly searching for the lost. Many lives were saved by this wonderful little station, so that it became famous. Some of those who were saved and various others in the surrounding areas wanted to become associated with the station and give of their time and money and effort for the support of its work. New boats were bought and new crews were trained. The little life-saving station grew. Some of the new members of the life-saving station were unhappy that the building was so crude and so poorly equipped. They felt that a more comfortable place should be provided as the first refuge of those saved from the sea. They replaced the emergency cots with beds and put better furniture in an enlarged building. Now the life-saving station became a popular gathering place for its members, and they redecorated it beautifully and furnished it as a sort of club. Less of the members were now interested in going to sea on life-saving missions, so they hired lifeboat crews to do this work. The mission of life-saving was still given lip service, but most were too busy or lacked the necessary commitment to take part in the life-saving activities personally. About this time, a large ship was wrecked off the coast, and the hired crews brought in boatloads of cold, wet, and half-drowned people. They were dirty and sick, some had skin of a different color, some spoke a strange language, and the beautiful new club was considerably messed up. So the property committee immediately had a shower house built outside the club where victims of shipwreck could be cleaned up before coming inside. At the next meeting, there was a split in the club membership most of the members wanted to stop the club life-saving activities as being unpleasant and a hindrance to the normal pattern of the club. But some members insisted that life-saving was their primary purpose and pointed out they were, that they were still called a life-saving station. But they were finally voted down and told that if they wanted to save the life of all various kinds of people who were shipwrecked in those waters, they could begin their own life-saving station down the coast. They did. As the years went by, the new station experienced the same changes that occurred in the old one. They evolved into a club, and yet another life-saving station was founded. If you visit the seacoast today, you will find a number of exclusive clubs along that shore. Shipwrecks are still frequent in those waters, but now most of the people drown. Don't know if maybe you'd heard that parable before. Uh, some people may have been familiar with it, but it's a pretty stark picture 
um, of what can happen when we're not focusing on the future, when we're not focusing on forever, and when we're not remembering that we're created to live for God, that we need his life in us to live for him, and that we're here to call others to live for God. Um, and so I just thought it would be helpful for us to just kind of pause and think about that. Um, it's not a specific um, message for our church. I'm not saying that our church is like a club or anything like that. Um, but we, if we're not focusing, we're drifting. And so um, you know, I know that I've experienced that with this last election cycle. It be, I became a lot more focused and a lot more interested in God's kingdom and what was going to happen. And now that that's behind me and behind us, there's, it's, there's not another event coming up that seems quite as big as that to help focus me. So I'm just wanting to, us to encourage each other to focus. And here's some hindrances that we have in focusing. Um, it's, a lot of times it's about our comfort versus God's call. And um, it's nice to be comfortable, isn't it? And there's nothing wrong with being comfortable. Uh, if it's not getting in the way of why we're here. And so um, if we really are engaged in lifestyles of comfort versus lifestyles of commission or mission, uh, then we should ask the Lord to forgive us and to help us. And, and I, I need to do that um, as far as my ability to having been, uh, whether I've been reaching out to others or not. Um, so that's the basics, really. It's kind of like a, you know, we always say we need to get back to basics. There's nothing more basic than you know, God has sent Jesus Christ, not counting our sins against us, so that we can be reconciled to him. And he, gave, he made him a sacrifice for sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. That's very basic. It's, it's really the only message. Um, and that's what, if we get back to basics, that's what's going to be going through our hearts and minds as we're going through the day. Um, we were privileged to have Dane Gressett here last week, uh, pastor of our sister church, Blue Ridge Community Church in Ruckersville, and he made these three observations, uh, these next three, to uh, what will, uh, what can cause us to be blind to the culture and the world around us even though we're born again, even though we have the light of Christ. He said, you know what? In, as you look at other people, there's more going on in somebody's life than meets the eye. So generally, I might or you might tend to just write somebody off because you see them in their circumstance or whatever. Oh, I know what's going on there. Okay, on to the next person, right? No, there's more going on than meets the eye. He also said we should look beyond the usual prospects. We, we tend to look for people who are like we are in order to share with those people because we feel there might be some kind of an automatic um, uh, starting point. Not zero, zero, like Steve said with the basketball game, but maybe there's already a little bit of trust there if there's somebody like me. Not necessarily. Um, God is working in all people, and we may be able to speak to that very person who is very different than the kind of person that we're um, used to um, conversing with. And also, we need to see where God is at work. Instead of just doing our thing and asking God to bless it, or instead of just assuming that God wants us to do a certain thing and then doing it, we should pray. Um, there's a big emphasis on prayer throughout all of this, uh, as, we've, as we've seen and, and we will continue to see. And so, God, what are you doing? What do you want us to do? Because of prayer, God directed people that we read about in the scriptures to go and do certain things that had amazing impact. And I think a lot of us are in this boat too, which is, well, I can't do everything, so I don't do anything. Uh, if you feel sort of paralyzed, well, I can't, how could I possibly impact the world? A lot of you already did it. 113 shoeboxes went out of here last week, right, for the Samaritan's Purse shoebox project. Um, you have a few neighbors. You might have 20 neighbors. What if you talk to one of them, right? What if I, uh, well, maybe not I, but our son Daniel, he's great at chocolate chip cookies. My wife, Michelle, who's great at baking. What if they uh, get some goodies together and we go and meet a neighbor that we haven't met before? Maybe that could, that, we can't do everything, but we can do something. And so 
Do you want purpose in your life? I mean, a lot of people feel like, wow, I just need purpose in my life. We have purpose in our lives. Our purpose is to live for God with the life that he's given us and to call others into that life. And so you've heard a couple things today. There's a Christmas parade outreach coming up. That's something that you and I can participate in. I'm going to give us an opportunity to do this as well. Concerted prayer for family and friends. Uh, a couple of years ago, we had some little cardstock cards, and you could write a person's first name only, just their first name. You could write on this card, and we put them up on a poster board as a way of reminding ourselves to pray daily or at least a lot, to pray for that particular person. Um, so we're going to have the opportunity here in just a moment. But as you think of someone that God's asking you to pray for, um, and, and maybe it's not the first person that comes to your mind, but you know, just do whoever God's, write, write down somebody's name that God gives you that he wants you to pray for. But do that on your own, but also when you're in groups, when you're at your home group meetings, uh, when you're at a prayer meeting, uh, when you have some kind of fellowship meeting, when you're at practice or rehearsal for choir or worship team or um, some other ministry group that you're part of, as you pray, pray for those names also. Let's keep those names of people before us. The cards are in red and green, and so that is, and that's in, they're in your bulletin, by the way, and that's why that's in there. And so this will remind us that the season of the advent of, and coming of our Lord is upon us. These are Christmas colors. The blood of Jesus, new life in Christ, right? Red and green. And might we be so bold as to pray, Lord, the person whose name I'm putting on here, would you save them by Christmas? Would you give them the gift of eternal life as their Christmas present? You know, I mean, we don't, sometimes we can be arbitrary about things. We can just sort of pick things and think it's God's will to pray something like that. But why wouldn't that be God's will for somebody we know to come to Christ by Christmas? And so that might be a way for me, at least, to think, Lord, okay, here's a deadline for me. Father, bring this person into your kingdom by Christmas. And so we'll have an opportunity to put their names on those cards in just a moment. Pray. <laughs> we need God's direction as we share the gospel, both personally with people as, and as a family. Like I kind of mentioned, take, take goodies to your neighbor or whatever you might want to do. Also corporately as a congregation, we always continually need God's guidance and direction about how to pray to reach the lost. You know, we have now, since we have giving online, there's an opportunity for you to not only uh, put your tithe in the general offering, but in addition to your tithe, you can put uh, offerings into a couple other categories online, or you can do that through the offering on a regular basis. But there are a huge number of needs in the community. We get probably an average of one call per day through the week of somebody who needs something. And we do contribute to SACRA monthly, and so that's where we you know, encourage them to go. Maybe God wants us to do more than that. So I'm not saying that he does, but maybe he does. So let's think about those kinds of things. Fast and pray. Some of us fasted and prayed before the election. Uh, maybe as I'm praying for some of these people, I could take a day or two to fast and pray for their salvation. And so um, as we uh, close and as we're singing our closing song today, I would invite you to take those cards that are in your uh, bulletins and write someone's name on there. If you have a pen, if you don't, there are a few pens up here, and there's a basket here on this table. And so as we're singing the final song, if you would uh, just put someone's name on a card, put it in there, and we'll get it up on a poster board to remind us for next week, uh, and that'll be in the back next week. But you can just bring that person as an offering to God. Lord, I am asking you to receive this person into your kingdom. Here, I'm presenting this person to you. And so just at your... Um, discretion come forward uh, during the as we're singing the last song and bring those cards and put them in the basket there okay so that's just one practical way that we can think about why we're here and how we're calling others into God's kingdom so uh, let's pray and ask the Lord to help us father we are so grateful that uh, we have been blessed beyond measure with the riches of Christ Lord we who used to be your enemies um, who were sinning against you. We inherited sin and we committed sin and we wanted nothing to do with you, Lord, but in your great 
mercy and grace and love. You broke into our lives. We heard the message of the gospel. We responded. You made us alive who were once dead. And Lord, we are your workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works that you've prepared in advance that we should walk in them. And so, Lord, now as we commit ourselves to you at the end of this time together here today, we pray that you would continue to reinforce in our hearts and minds that we are yours, that you have bought us with the precious blood of Jesus, and that we belong to you. Lord, that it's the new life in Christ that you've given us that makes us really alive to you and enables us, gives us the strength and the courage and the power to go forward into this life and to call others And that we would call others, Lord. We would let people know that they are created for a purpose. And so, Father, as we write names on these cards, I pray that you would use this um, as an opportunity for us to pray these people into the kingdom of God. Uh, Lord, those who are outside of Christ now, we ask that we would hear about different ones coming into your kingdom, even by Christmas. And, Lord, as we pray for people, then we may be even more... Um, able to speak with people. Lord, tear down the hindrances and the fears that we have and set us free, Lord. Let us become alive and activated in you through the power of your spirit and the life of Christ that you've given us. Um, Lord, we thank you that you are a loving and forgiving God. And we pray that not only we, but many, many, many others will also be there at that table on that day at the marriage supper of the Lamb. And we commit ourselves to you and your purpose in Jesus' name. Amen.